Good morning. Brennan's prayer and that song we just sang are our prayer this morning and every Sunday morning when God's word is proclaimed. It's our prayer that the Lord would speak and then our hearts would be ready to hear and to practice obedience and practice reverence and glory in our God. Uh, that, is, that is our prayer every time uh, someone stands up in this pulpit and proclaims God's word or someone stands in an ABF and teaches God's word. We're praying that God would be so gracious and so merciful to speak to us in a way that we can hear. But that is also our prayer every time we open the Bible, every time we open the Bible on our own, in, in the quiet of your own house, you open God's word and you pray that he would speak to you. It is uh, a Christian duty to study God's word, to read it and study it, but it's also just a glorious, glorious privilege that the God of the universe, the God who slung the stars out into the universe, the one who's uh, every, every beat of your heart, every breath you take is dependent upon him, that that very God would say, I am willing to speak to you in a way that you can hear and understand. Last week, I introduced this uh, two-week mini-series on how to study the Bible uh, with six principles for faithful Bible study. And my goal last week was both to motivate you to study scripture, but also give you some help in doing so, how to think about Bible study and give you a method. And uh, the method that I laid out uh, observation, interpretation, application, faithful exegesis. Uh, if you were not here last week, I would encourage you to, to listen to that sermon at some point in time, and get a little bit more background for this morning. I'm going to do a little bit of overview, but very little overview of that method because we're going to be using it today uh, together in the service. That method, observation, we ask, what does the text say? What does the text say? say. We read the text, we reread it, we take careful note of the context, which is so vital to understand scripture. What is the context of this portion of scripture? We ask questions of the text. And then we take those, the answers to those questions and we interpret and in, do interpretation. What does the text mean? What did the original author mean by what he wrote? That's what we're trying to get to, the authorial intent behind a passage of scripture. What is the topic he's writing about? And what does he say about that topic? Remember, the whole point of Bible study is to figure out what the original author meant when he wrote it. There is only ever one right interpretation of a text of scripture, okay? And then we have application, observation, interpretation, and application. In application, we say, well, how does that text apply to my life? How does it have any relevance to me? And so we go about these three processes in order to understand scripture. And this is how God speaks to us through his word. This is our method of Bible study and this is how we hear from God. And as I mentioned last week, I, I, this morning I wanna actually do Bible study together here in the service. And uh, someone asked me last week, well, what does that mean? What are you gonna do? And I said, I don't know. I really don't know. I'm not sure how this is going to go. And after the sermon this morning, you could tell me that you thought it flopped or you thought it was helpful. I trust by the Spirit of God that, um, that we'll be able to be helpful as we walk through some texts of Scripture and do some, some Bible study together. Let me tell you what I did this week. I, I chose two passages of Scripture, one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament, and I did a brief Bible study on those passages. And when I say brief, I mean brief. I, I don't think I studied either passage for more than probably 30 minutes. And uh, now, when I would normally preach a text of scripture from this pulpit, I would study much longer than that. If I was teaching in an ABF, I would study much longer than that. Um, hopefully this is the, the first time and maybe the last time you have a, someone stand up behind this pulpit and say, I, I trust me, I studied very little for the sermon. You know. Uh, but I did that for this reason. Uh, I, I want you, I want to be able to stand up here today and tell you this is a Bible study you can do. You don't need hours and hours of time. You don't need a seminary degree. You don't need a ton of resources. You can do this kind of study. 
Um, I didn't use a study Bible. I didn't use a commentary. I didn't use any other resources than the Bible that I have. And the Bible I have doesn't even have those introductions to each book of the Bible that many of your Bibles have. I use nothing but the text of scripture. Okay, we'll talk about resources later on, but I, I wanna show you that armed with nothing more than the Bible, God can speak to you through his word as we employ faithful methods of Bible study. All right, I chose, as I said, two passages of scripture, one from the old, that's Ezekiel chapter two, and one from the new, that's 1 Corinthians chapter eight. If those passages sound random, it's because they are, they totally are, like almost did the sort of let your Bible fall open kind of thing. And the reason is this, it, I could have picked David and Goliath, right? I could have picked the Ten Commandments. I could have picked some of these highlight passages of Scripture, and uh, I think that would have been doing you a disservice because those Scriptures are highlights, but what about all the passages in between? And I didn't pick a first chapter of uh, a book because I wanted to, to show you how to put it into context. So I picked a, Ezekiel chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Okay, I really don't know a ton about the book of Ezekiel. I mean, I know some, but uh, I feel like that's a book where a lot of people don't know a ton about. So I'm not cheating or anything. I didn't write a dissertation on Ezekiel. We're just all in this together. We're gonna study Ezekiel chapter two together. And I think you can do what we do here in less than 30 minutes, each of these. Uh, we're gonna move fairly fast. Uh, and, and I apologize for that. You'd want to go a little more slowly, obviously, but we're, I'm going to try to show you the fruit of the study of what I've done. Okay, now it's going to be really important that you have a Bible in front of you so you can open your own copy of the Word of God or if, uh, if you don't have one, look under the, under the seats and there's a pew Bible there and let's start out by opening up to Ezekiel chapter 2. It's a little a little past the halfway mark in your Bible, Ezekiel chapter two, right after the book of uh, Lamentations. As all of you know where Lamentations is, right? <laughs> Ezekiel two. Now, I'm, uh, we, we've put a number of slides up this morning, kind of the, the things that we, we've studied, the, conclusions that we make, the answer to the questions that we ask are going to be up on the slides. So between looking at your Bibles and looking at the slides, you should have little need to look at me, which is a good thing, right, for all of us. So we first, the first question we ask is, where does this fit into the overall story of the Bible? Remember last week we talked about creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. All of the Bible can be laid out in that sort of a scheme, creation, fall, redemption, restoration. And under that category of redemption, we said, starting with Abraham in Genesis 12, God initiates redemption. And through the rest of the Old Testament, this is the, the process of initiating the redemption of the world through his people Israel. That's where Ezekiel falls. God has chosen his people Israel to be a beacon of light to the world, but they've rebelled against him, and he's sending them into exile in Babylon, Babylon to discipline them for their idolatry. Some of them, like Ezekiel, are already in exile, but more are going to be sent into exile soon. Where did I get that? I got that from just reading the first few chapters of the book of Ezekiel. It all, it's all there. And the last couple of chapters of 2 Kings, where, the, where Israel falls into exile. So with my Bible, do a little reading, and you see, okay, Ezekiel went into exile with some of the first exiles, and uh, the rest of Israel is going to be carried off into exile. Okay, so let's make some observation, observation of our text. Before we actually read the text, we're going to say, what is the context of Ezekiel 2? How does it fit into the book of Ezekiel? Ezekiel 2. Well, if we look back at Ezekiel chapter 1, look at the first verse. In the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the exiles by the Chebar Canal, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiachin. So Ezekiel is in Babylon with some of the exiles uh, early on in the, exile, in the time of the exile. And Ezekiel has a vision of the glory of the Lord. If we were to read the rest of Ezekiel chapter one, you would see that he sees this crazy vision, like these, these uh, 
messengers who have four faces and they have wings and they move together and, and there's a wheel and there's a wheel in the middle of the wheel and the wheel has eyes on it and it's just sort of overwhelming. I think Ezekiel is trying to put into human words and human thoughts this vision that's almost indescribable in Ezekiel 1. And then we come to verse 28. Look at verse 28. Again, we're setting the context for Ezekiel 2. Like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard the voice of one speaking. So God gives Ezekiel this vision, this overwhelming vision. He falls on his face and now God is going to talk specifically to Ezekiel. And that's what we have in Ezekiel 2. Okay, let's read our passage this morning. Ezekiel 2, 1 through 7. And he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to nations of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants also are impudent and stubborn. I send you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. And whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, be not afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns are with you and you sit on scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, for they are a rebellious house. And you shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house. It is the reading of God's word. I read that multiple times this week, and then I read in some other translations. I read in the Christian Standard Bible, which is a, a formal equivalence translation. Excuse me, I fell behind here. Uh, the, the, the Christian Standard Bible, it's a literal translation of scripture. I read it in the New, New International Version, which is a, a little looser translation. I even read it in the New Living Translation, which is a, which is a paraphrase. And uh, if you want to throw rocks at me later for using the New Living Translation, feel free. But uh, there is a purpose of that. As I read, I, I want to study in a literal translation, but I read a few other things just to kind of fill out my thinking and my understanding of the passage. And then we ask questions of the text. We ask some questions of the text. Who? Who's involved here? Ezekiel's involved, and God calls him son of man. Israel is involved. Obviously, God talking about Israel. The Lord is involved here, right? Speaking to Ezekiel. When? Well, we already looked at that in Ezekiel chapter 1. This is early in the time of exile. We ask the question, where? We've already said this is in Babylon. How? There's a how in the text. Look at verse 2. The Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. How did Ezekiel receive this message from the Lord? Because the Spirit of God entered into him. Then we ask the question of what. And by what, I just mean what's the content? What's actually going on in the text? And you may read through and get a, a different bullet list, but the point is to read through and say, what's happening? What's happening? What's going on? What's being said? This is what I put down. The Lord commissioned Ezekiel to speak to Israel. You see that in verse 3. He says, I'm sending you to the people of Israel. We see throughout the text, Israel was rebellious and hard-hearted. Don't you see that? Multiple times, they're rebellious people, they're stubborn people, they're not obstinate people. You get the idea, at least, that they may not listen to what he says, right? Don't, don't you see that in the text? Whether they hear or not, verse 5, whether they hear or refuse to hear, they may not listen, and there's probably a good chance they won't. And then you also see this in the text, he is not to be afraid of them, right? Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. So then we ask the question, why? Why? What's the why in the text? Why? Well, Ezekiel's being sent by God to speak to Israel. Did you see this in verse 5? So that they will know they have been spoken to by God, by God's prophet, even if they don't believe. You see that in verse 5? Whether they refuse, hear or refuse to hear, they will know that a prophet has been among you. That's why God has sent, is, is sending Ezekiel to them. He's not to be afraid. This is very interesting. He is not to be afraid in the end of verse 6 because they are a rebellious house. You see that word for there? He's, God says to them, says to Ezekiel, don't be afraid of them because they are rebels. 
Okay, that's the why. So let's take this, and you could do, certainly do more observations, spend more time with the text, but let's make an interpretation. What does it mean? What does this mean? What's the subject here? The subject is the call of Ezekiel by God. God calling Ezekiel, right? That's what the subject of the text is. What does he say about that subject? Well, God is calling Ezekiel to speak his words to Israel without fear, even though Israel is rebellious and will make it difficult for him. Do you see that? That's how I summarize what this text is about. God is calling Ezekiel to speak to his people, and he's to do that without fear, even though Israel is going to make it hard on him. Okay? All right. So if that's our interpretation of the text, let's make an application. So what? So what? How does this apply to me? If you remember, we talked about the various ways that an old, uh, a text written back there in that day come, be, uh, becomes relevant to us here. One of the ways is, is, is it direct? Is it the exact same correspondence today as it is then? And the answer, of course, is no. None of us are being spoken to audibly by God right now, calling us to go to the nation of Israel and tell Israel that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed and people are going to be carried off into Babylon, right? We all agree on that. It's not direct. But is there an example in the text? Well, no, there's not really an example in the text because Ezekiel doesn't do anything. He's only just hearing from God. But are there principles in the text that can apply today? And I'd say, absolutely. There are principles in the text, and we're going to pull those principles out and bring them over to today. What are some of those principles? Well, one, God may call one of his own into serving him in a very difficult, not very fruitful ministry. Right? We, we now have precedent for that. If nowhere else in Scripture, we have it right here. God may call one of his own into a ministry that is not very fruitful and is very difficult. Because he does it with Ezekiel. Another principle, when speaking truth to those in rebellion against God, the very fact that they're in rebellion should motivate us not to be afraid. These folks are on the, God's enemies are on the losing side, so why be afraid of them? The God of the universe is on your side, right? You see this principle in the text? A reason not to fear? Another one, people may recognize that God is with you, even if they themselves do not repent or believe. You saw this in the text, right? Whether they hear or refuse to hear, they'll know that a prophet has been among them. There is a principle that you can apply. People may know that God is with you based on your words, based upon your actions, even if they choose not to repent and believe, right? This is, this is Matthew 5. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. They may say, well, God is with that person. That person loves the Lord and God is with them, even if they don't repent. Another principle in the text, disobedience toward God is a form of rebellion against him. Do you see how many times uh, God says they're rebellious, they're rebellious, they're rebellious. Disobedience against God is rebellion. So we've drawn some principles out of the text and now we say, okay, if this is you doing this study, you ask the question, okay, what does that mean for me? What do those principles do for me? Is there a sin I need to confess? Perhaps the fear of man. Is there something to thank God for in this text? I would say yes, absolutely. Do you see God's compassion here? How many times does he say they're rebellious and stubborn and obstinate? And what is he doing? He's sending another prophet to them. He's not done with them. He continues to send people with his message. God's compassion here. Is there something you need to begin praying about? Maybe there's a person you know who needs Christ or someone who's abandoned the faith and you need to make this a matter of prayer. Is there something you should start doing or need to stop doing? Is there something you've avoided doing that God has called you to do but you've been avoiding it out of fear? What does Ezekiel 2 say to you about that? Is there a ministry opportunity you're neglecting? Is there a way this text applies to my relationship with others? Maybe for some of you, there's a, there's a loving confrontation that needs to happen and you're avoiding it because of fear. So we apply this to our own lives. 
And then we finish, as we always finish, with the connection to Christ, the Christ connection. How does this point us to Jesus Christ? Every text in scripture points us in some way, shape, or form to Jesus Christ. And the connection here, do you see it right there in verse one? He said to me, son of man. Ezekiel, a son of man, was to preach a message to his own people that they would not listen to. And one day, Jesus, the capital S, son of man, will be called to preach a message to God's people that they would not hear. And they would so refuse to hear it that they would nail him to a tree. Ezekiel is a sign that points us to Jesus Christ. One who came to his own and his own received him not. See here in the text too, the role of the spirit of God. It was the spirit who enabled Ezekiel to hear the message and be commissioned to go and be a messenger for God. Do you see that? And you fast forward to Matthew chapter four and Jesus Christ in the water of baptism, the spirit of God comes upon him and he's commissioned to go and preach the message to his people. And now all of us who are in Christ receive that same spirit that equips us and enables us to do the ministry God has called for us. So this, in a few brief minutes, is a Bible study on Ezekiel chapter two verses one through seven, observation, interpretation, and application. Now we're gonna jump to the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter eight. I'd invite you to turn there to 1 Corinthians chapter eight. Last week I mentioned to you that we typically don't do Bible study on an entire chapter at a time. Um, I like doing paragraphs, but in this case, this this entire chapter, the the, the flow of thought all hangs together here. And so I've chosen to do um, all of 1 Corinthians chapter eight here. We're gonna look at it all at once. 1 Corinthians chapter eight, verse one through 13. And before we read it, we ask, well, where does this fit into the overall story of the Bible? This of course is Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. This is redemption. Redemption initiated in the Old Testament. Redemption accomplished in the Gospels in the life of Jesus Christ. And now redemption applied. What Jesus has done to redeem humanity is now applied into the lives of people like you and me. Okay? You've got Jews and Gentiles coming to believe in Christ, being brought into the church. And the book of 1 Corinthians was written by the Apostle Paul who founded the church in Corinth. Uh, Just to be honest with you, I knew that Paul was involved there, but I wasn't sure exactly which chapter, so I did what any of you could do. I opened the book of Acts and I just flipped through and read until I found Paul landing in Corinth. And he founded the church in Corinth. He spent a year and a half there in that church, preaching and teaching. And now Paul's writing to the Corinthian church because there are a number of problems going on in the congregation. The effects of the fall, creation fall, the effects of the fall are ongoing in the life of this congregation. And so he is writing to apply the gospel of redemption to these particular problems. And in chapter eight, the problem is food offered to idols and what to do about that. So let's make observation from the text. Before we read it, We're going to look at the context. What's the immediate context of 1 Corinthians 8? What comes right before 1 Corinthians 8 is 1 Corinthians 7, right? So you look at 1 Corinthians 7, you read it, and it's all about uh, marriage and divorce and remarriage and singleness and widowhood and those kind of things. When you get to 1 Corinthians 8, look at the first word in 1 Corinthians 8. Now, and he says, now concerning food offered to idols. So Paul is changing subjects. So we've done the right thing to look at the context, but when we look at the context, we say, okay, new subject. I don't have to go back and figure out what he's saying in 1 Corinthians 7, 15 to understand this because it's a new context. Same way, we do do something, right? If if you're giving instructions, you say, okay, now to do this. Now, when it comes to this, you gotta do the, you know, you're, you're, you're changing subjects and that's what Paul is doing. So let's read our text here, 1 Corinthians chapter eight. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. 
If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We're no worse off if we do not eat, no better if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. That is the reading of God's word in the English Standard Version. I also read the text in the Christian Standard Bible, and I have actually put a few of the verses up here, just a little different wording. Verse 7, however, not everyone has this knowledge. Some have been so used to idolatry up until now that when they eat food sacrificed to an idol, their conscience being weak is defiled. See, a little different wording helps fill in our understanding. Verse 10 and 11, for if someone sees you, the one who has knowledge, dining in an idol's temple, won't his weak conscience be encouraged to eat food offered to idols? So the weak person, the brother or sister for whom Christ died, is ruined by your knowledge. And I did. Look at the uh, New Living Translation. Now, when you're reading a paraphrase, like a New, new Living Translation, you are reading interpretation not just translation. This is someone taking the words of the Bible and putting them into their own words, which when that happens, you're reading some interpretation. So maybe I cheated. This is almost like reading a commentary, okay? Verse seven in the New Living Translation. However, not all believers know this. Some are accustomed to thinking of idols as being real. So when they eat food that has been offered to idols, they think of it as the worship of real gods and their weak consciences are violated. Or verse 12, and when you sin against other believers by encouraging them to do something they believe is wrong, you're sinning against Christ. Okay, do you see, you kind of fill out the meaning here of what's going on in the text. Let's ask some questions. Who, there's a number of who in the text. There are these people who have knowledge. There are Christians with weak consciences. There's God in the text and false gods, idols. There's Christ and there's Paul, all involved in the text here. The when, the situation is when believers eat food sacrificed to idols. Some, some were going to these temple feasts and eating food that had just been sacrificed to an idol. It was happening at the temple, at the temples or near the temples. There's a how in the text, I think, as I saw it. By exercising freedoms that not all enjoyed, some were sinning against Christ. There's a how. How were some sinning against Christ? By exercising freedoms in a way that caused problems for others. How about the what? What's the content here of the chapter? You have meat being sacrificed to idols. We know that's going on there. There's no such thing as another God, verse four. There is no such thing as another God. Verse eight, neither eating foods or abstaining from certain foods will provide any credit before God. God is not more pleased with you if you don't go to the temple and eat. He's not more pleased with you if you do go to the temple and eat. What you eat is not gonna uh, give you commendation before God. Believers with weak consciences can be led to sin by watching what other believers do. That's there in the text. 
And it's a sin against Christ to exercise your freedom in such a way that a weak believer is led to sin. That's what he, that's kind of how he summarizes at the end there. Okay, do you see this content in the text? This is what the text is about. How about the why? There are two big whys that kind of stood out to me in this text. One is that eating meat sacrificed to other gods is harmless because there are no such thing as other gods. You're eating as something that doesn't exist. It's a figment of your imagination, right? So it's harmless. But the other why is eating meat sacrificed to other gods can still be sinful because not everyone has that same understanding. Okay. So let's take all of that data. And once again, if you've studied this, you probably have more than that. But let's take that and let's come to a conclusion. What's the interpretation of the passage? What is it about? Well, the text is obviously about eating food offered to idols. And what does Paul say about eating food offered? offered to idols. He says, although eat, eating meat offered to idols was not sinful, Paul cautioned the believers who understood this not to exercise this freedom in a way that would draw believers who didn't understand this truth into sinning against their consciences. Okay? Maybe we can just illustrate this for a moment. What Paul's saying, let's imagine two halves of the church here. And everyone over here, you're the, you're the meat eaters, the, the sacrificed meat eaters, right? You say, look, there is no such thing as another God. I can go to the temple of Artemis, and when they sell the meat after it's being, been sacrificed, I can eat that. It's not a big deal. Folks over here are like, uh, I came out of paganism, or I've got pagan friends, and I, I just, I can't go there. I can't eat that in good conscience. And the, those who eat and those who don't eat can be in the same congregation with no problems. Okay? But the first couple of rows over here in this group. These folks aren't just the ones who eat at the temple. They're the ones who like to brag about it. They're the ones who have knowledge and they're kind of flaunting it, right? That's what's going on with a, with a subset over here. They like show up at church with their Zeus barbecue shirt on, you know, like I eat meat, I eat temple meat, and it's because I know stuff that all those people over there don't know, right? They're a problem because there's a group over here, not everyone, but there's a group over here, these first few rows over here, who not only say, I can't eat that meat, but their consciences are weak. They're not strong. And so when they see a believer do that, they think, man, I don't think this is right, but I saw her do it, and she's, she's just such a godly person. I guess I'll eat. And they're violating their own conscience. And by violating their own conscience, they're sinning. That's what's going on in the text. So Paul's talking to this little subset group over here, saying, watch how you use your freedom, because there's a subset group over here who, when they see you do that, will sin. Okay? That's the interpretation of what's going on. How do we make application? What's our application? How, how is this relevant? Is this a direct uh, no, none of us live near, a, you know, a pagan temple. I don't think any of you are, you know, wondering if you're going to eat lunch today at the, the, the temple of Artemis or whatever. It's not a direct application. Is there an example in the text? There is. There's principle in the text. I think there's universal truths in the text. So let's talk about this. There's a positive example from the text. Paul himself is a positive example from the text, right? Don't you love what he says there at the end? Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. Let me tell you something. If, if I could eat meat or not eat meat, if eating meat is going to cause someone to sin, I, I, don't, I never have to have another, another taco as long as I live, right? That's what Paul's saying. There's an example there. He would enjoy his Christian freedom when appropriate or restrict those Christian freedoms if they may be a problem for another. There are a number of principles from the text as I see them. If an activity in itself isn't sinful, in and of itself isn't sinful, then in the fact that it's associated with pagan worship doesn't make it sinful either. Paul teaches clearly in the text it's not wrong to eat meat sacrificed to idols. So just the fact that something may be associated with something sinful or paganism didn't make it sinful. Another principle in the text, to justify certain behaviors with the defense that we know more, we understand better than other Christians, that might be the kind of knowledge that Paul's talking about with being puffed up here. 
if you find yourself defending, well, I can do this freedom, I can do, because I have knowledge that ah, those, those other Christians, they don't get, they don't understand. That's the kind of knowledge that puffs up. As a matter of fact, the knowledge that puffs up isn't facts or theology per se, it's, it's biblical principles, true biblical principles that are wrongly applied or unlovingly applied. That's the knowledge that puffs up. Another principle in the text, to go against your own conscience is sin. To sin against your brother or sister in Christ is to sin against Christ. And it's Christian love and obedience to restrain from exercising your Christian freedom when necessary to avoid leading a brother or sister into sin. There's times when the right thing to do is refrain and restrain your own freedom so not to cause someone else to sin. Are there universal truths in the text? There are. The beautiful, glorious truth, there is only one God. We do not have to fear false gods. We do not have to worry about what this God, that God, what association with this God or that God. There is only one God. All other gods have no existence. And I also see there, I love that in verse three, but if anyone loves God, he is known by God. A more important knowledge than any knowledge we might have is the knowledge that God has of us. We are known by him. And so for you, if you're doing this Bible study and you're pulling these principles out of the text, is there, is there a sin you need to confess? Maybe it's flaunting Christian freedoms. Maybe it's in consideration of other Christians. Is there something to thank God for? Is there a motivation to worship him? Is there something you need to begin praying about? Maybe, maybe it's your relationship to food and drink. This is not the only place in scripture that Paul addresses our relationship to food and drink because uh, for some, some are in slavery to certain kinds of food or drink or whatever it might be. Is there something you need to be praying about? Is there something you should start doing or need to stop doing? Is there a way this text applies in your relationship with others? How often do you consider the impact of your life on others, particularly others in the body of Christ, in particular others who may be weak in conscience? And then finally, we connect it to Christ. You know, this is a text about Christian freedom and rights. That's what this text is about. We have rights as Christians. And Jesus Christ had all the rights of being the God of the universe. And he laid those rights aside. He laid down his rights for your benefit and for my benefit. If he had retained his right, if he had said, no, I have the right to live, he would not have died and we would still be in our sins. So because of Christ, as we look to Christ, we have this model for laying down our own rights for the blessing of others, for the sake of others. Okay. So we have done a couple of Bible studies here, Ezekiel 2, 1 Corinthians 8, and hopefully, as we've kind of walked through these together, I've given you a little bit of a, a model, an idea of how to study the scriptures and interpret them and apply them. You don't have to have a ton of books or a lot of fancy technology to mine God's word for, for gold and find it. But I do want to talk uh, just real briefly about those books and that technology. I am not at all against it. I don't want to discourage you from using those resources. I want to encourage you to use those resources. Uh, a good commentary can really help you see more in the text than you have seen, can help uh, give you additional insight or confirm the interpretations that you have made. I plan on putting a, a list of resources in the church website that you might find helpful for Bible study. Uh, we, we are blessed to live in the day, in the, the age, in the place that we live because uh, the resources that we have are just abundant. Uh, you, you folks have sent me to India. And they're, they're thankful if they can get a Bible in where we've, we were going, a, a good translation in their own language. And I can walk into that, my office over there and have and just an abundance of resources. So we ought to take advantage of those resources and help us in our Bible study. A good study Bible, the ESV study Bible, is a great place to start. 
I just want to encourage you not to shortchange the Bible study process. There is more joy, more satisfaction found out of getting gold from Scripture in our own study than merely reading what uh, someone else says about it. But there's one other resource uh, I, want to, uh, I want to mention as we close. The most important resource for your Bible study, ex- uh, accepting the Holy Spirit, except for the Holy Spirit. The most important resource for your Bible study is people. It is the church, right? The, the, the most soul-satisfying, joy-producing, growth-enhancing way to study Scripture is that I'm, I'm studying it on my own, and I'm reading and taking in God's Word, and then I get together with other believers, and we do the same thing together. We do that right here uh, together in worship. We do that in ABF, in fellowship together around God's word. We do that in small groups, Bible studies, and so forth. So you do, you do not give away one for the sake of the other. It is it's about doing this both. Studying the God, God's word on your own and in fellowship with others, that's what we want. God's, worth is worth, God's word is worth more than gold. So let's take in as much of it as we can. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the spirit of God that illumines the truths of your word to our hearts. Uh, We thank you for the privilege of studying the scriptures and we want to say to you this morning that we want to grow. We want to grow in this area, this area of obedience um, to the, the duty and the privilege of studying your word. Lord, I pray you'd help us to be more diligent about reading and knowing your word than we are about the the trivial things of life that pass away. So help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our closing response is a, is a prayer. We're going to pray, cause your word to come alive in us. Give us faith for what we cannot see. Give us passion for your purity. Holy Spirit, breathe new life in me. Let's stand and sing together.
Jesus, speaking to his father, John chapter 17, said of us, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. You are dismissed.